All right, welcome back. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the family head's health is not as it, not at its best. He seemed extremely sad not to be able to share lunch with you all, now that you have gathered for this event that occurs but once a year. Yes, very sad. Golda, let the lunch begin. Certainly. I shall begin today's luncheon. Oh, are they going to read me the entire menu? Dr. Nanjo, is father's condition really that bad? Couldn't he have at least let us see his face? It's more a problem of mood than a physical condition. And for that, there is no medicine I can prescribe. Hey, are we talking about his mood again? You've got to be kidding me. We took time out of our schedules during this damn busy autumn season just to come and find out how he's doing. And now he's... Humph! Then you should be happy, Rudolph. You now know how he's doing. Or what would you rather... Or what? Would you rather take my place and try to persuade our ill-humoured father to come join us? Are you kidding? Rudolph shrugged. Apparently, though Rudolph was willing to be indignant at how self-centred his father was, he wasn't particularly disappointed to be spared a face-to-face -face meeting. Does it seem like his mood will improve before dinner, Kraus Nisan? I have no idea. If you want to know that, you should ask him directly. Although I think his mood will improve faster if we don't bother him. Genji-san's the only one who can get grandfather out of a funk. It's pretty pathetic though, making the servants deal with your own parents' bad mood. Jessica, don't speak out of turn. She'd planned for her complaint to be heard only by her cousins, but it had reached even Krause's ears. Scolded, Jessica scowled and turned away, sulking. If he's as cranky as they make him sound, he can't be terribly sick, right? I mean... They're saying he's in a bad mood, not that he's got no energy, which at least proves he's got his wits about him. It's because Grandfather has especially strong willpower. However, that doesn't necessarily mean his body will be able to keep up. Since last year, they keep saying that he has three months left. If the initial diagnosis was correct, Grandfather has been prolonging his life by willpower alone. I could believe it. It's right for us to worry about him. Lunch started with the family head seat still empty. The man who should be sitting there had already grown old, and the brilliant glory which had rebuilt the Ushiromiya family in the span of a single lifetime was being forgotten. Even though they were beginning the meal with that seat still empty, no one felt it was that odd anymore. Ooh, got me again. Tick, 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 tick. All right, is that the time? So it's now 1.30? Because that would make sense. The Ushiromiya Family Conference was held once every year on the first weekend of October. If a normal family were to hold a so-called family conference, you'd expect it to be nothing more than a reunion of rarely seen relatives who greet each other around buckets of sushi or something. <gasps> I want a bucket of sushi. However, Part of the family's great fortune had been lent out to grandfather's children, and no one in this family was considered an adult until they had met with success in business, so this meeting literally was a conference. How much of the fortune was invested? What sort of business was conducted? How much profit was earned? As a result, how much of the fortune borrowed from the main family could be repaid? Or possibly, how much more would be borrowed for future business ventures? What lessons had they learned, and what could they learn from their mistakes? It seems that topics like these were discussed very seriously in the past. My dad said it was like lying on a bed of nails. Apparently, it used to be very serious. It used to be a very serious family meeting, where people were bathed in scornful and angry voices, and some people even got slapped despite their age. Huh. However, that had become a thing of the past. Now, with everyone pursuing their own business ventures and achieving success, it was becoming more of a normal yearly get-together. Even so, telling grandfather about recent events was extremely stressful. 
So while it was nothing more than a simple get-together for us grandchildren, it was still a real stomachache for our parents. The absence of the man who was, their so who was the source of all this trouble, regardless of the reason, probably made today's lunch taste much more delicious. The phrase, while the demon is not around, everyone can relax, comes to mind. Anyway, let's introduce Jessica's father, whose face I haven't seen in six years. The man sitting to my father's left is his older brother, and Jessica's father, Uncle Kuraus. Kura Usu. Ha, not a Uncle Kraus. This name sure is easy to read, yeah, in <laughs> Sonomomo. Kraus. Kura Usu. Now that we've gotten used to this string of weird names, our perspective is totally skewed. So Kraus actually doesn't seem that bad. It even starts to sound kind of cool. I suppose. If you really try. Just like with Aunt Natsuhi, I didn't have many memories of speaking with Uncle Kraus. He had never been one to chat to children, and I felt like he was always talking with the adults, just like Aunt Natsuhi. According to my father's gossip, he was a spiteful and violent man. Ugh. If what he said was true, Uncle Kraus used to be very domineering from his position as the el oldest sibling. Eldest? Oldest? And was despised by all the other siblings. Though, despite that, those siblings all seemed to be chatting happily together. Oh well, even if their relationship was bad when they were children, sometimes when people grow up and live apart from each other, their relationships change. This is true. That's probably what this was. After all, they all had children of about the same age. By sharing the same family environment, they probably profited by exchanging opinions. Maybe because of that, a short while ago, the circle of parents began to discuss the exams Jessica and I would be taking. Jessica, in order to escape questions about exams from my father on her left, purposefully faced right while firing off a rapid series of comments, not giving him any chance to get a word in. Moving on, let's take a look, let's look at the end opposite from Kraus and the others. In the very last seat at the table, an old gentleman with a sturdy physique sat facing Kirie-san. This was my first time meeting him. I had only just been introduced to him, but it seems he's grandfather's personal doctor, a man called Nanjo. I heard he used to own a huge clinic on the nearby island of Nijima, but he turned it over to his son and began living a life of leisure in his old age. He had known grandfather since the very beginning, when the mansion was first constructed on this island, and had built up a relationship over several decades. I thought at first that the two of them might have gotten to know each other through grandfather's suspicious hobbies, but it seems he was actually grandfather's chess partner. I see. That kind of hobby seems very like our grandfather, what with his love of all things western. Nanjo is probably the only person who could enter Rokkenjima despite being neither a family member nor a servant. He looked like a calm old gentleman as he listened to the discussion between Kirie and the other women who sat near to him. Considering how long he stayed by the side of our short-tempered grandfather, his generous heart was probably nothing to laugh at. Still, even if he was a family doctor, having anyone outside the Ushiromiya family attend the family conference was a little odd. It made me think that grandfather's condition might have worsened so much and be a major topic of discussion at today's conference. After all, George said something like that just a second ago. Something about how we've been getting continuous reports since around last year that grandfather didn't have long to live. It's nasty to think about, but consider how rich grandfather is. At the time of his death, his wealth will suddenly be released, probably along with a fair share of our parents' stomach acid and it'll lead to ulcers for everyone. After all, this sort of thing just gets messier when there's more wealth to be divided. There's a good chance they'll be talking about stuff like that at the family conference. Still, it's not like it's got anything to do with us kids. Finally, even though he hasn't shown up, let me introduce our grandfather. The person who should be sitting in the, that incipient's chair is Ushiromiya Kinzo. It really sucks. Everyone else in the family has these weird names, but he's got this perfectly normal one himself. If only his name were written Kinzo, but he let us call him Goldsmith or something. I'd totally freak out. But Kinzo sounds cool. Goldsmith sounds stupid. 
As you can probably guess by now, he's a frightening person with an extremely short temper. I'm one of his grandchildren, not a son, and I haven't seen him since elementary school. Thanks to that, I have no memory of being beaten myself, but our parents were apparently raised with an iron fist. Oh. That earlier conversation between my dad and Uncle Krauss about who should go convince grandfather to come down seems pretty darn funny once you know their background. You can't really tell grandfather's story without covering that pivotal event back before the Showa era. Oh god. We getting a flashback? Until the Meiji and Taisho eras, the Ushiromiya family was great and prosperous. They owned several spinning mills, making them rich enough to just double over laughing every day as the money kept rolling in. That must be nice. Incidentally, grandfather was a member of a branch family, and had pretty much nothing to do with the main family. Not only was he way down the list of people who could inherit the headship, but he had hardly any contact with the glamorous main family. However, during the great Kanto earthquake in the year Taisho 12, 1923, the mansion owned by the Ushiromiya family in Odawara was flattened. The spinning mills in Tokyo were all burned down in a huge fire, and the Ushiromiya family lost most of its wealth and family members in an instant. So, once they started trying to figure out who the successor to the Ushiromiya family should be, they apparently found no one remaining except Kinzo in his branch family. Mmm, suspicious. In Kinzo's later reminis reminiscences, he referenced to this as good fortune, so great that it overturned fate. With that, grandfather's boring everyday life did a 180. He was entrusted with reviving the dying Ushiromiya family, which had lost nearly all its wealth. However, just because he had been entrusted with this task didn't mean he could accomplish it. Apparently, those around him weren't really expecting much. However, this is when Grandfather began displaying his extraordinary talent and good luck. Grandfather used all of the family's remaining wealth, as well as everything from the hair on his head to his toenails, as collateral in order to borrow a massive amount of money. Who on earth is paying money for toenails? Once he'd built up a gigantic war chest, he immediately invested in business. His businesses. It was like someone tumbling down a hill on a bike without any brakes. I've been there. And then jumping onto a neighboring bike. And then another one. Just like some crazy street performance. I'll bet everyone thought Grandfather had no business ability whatsoever. However, after several miracles and turns of good luck, with coincidences piling up at, and every chance taken advantage of, he was suddenly in control of powerful connections with the occupying forces. At that time, MacArthur and the GHQ were the ultimate authority in Japan. Grandfather, in a twinkle of an eye, began succeeding in business under the protection of the occupying forces, quickly becoming very rich. By this point, it's probably safe to say that information, not luck, saved the day. He must have made some seriously deep connections with the occupying forces. Grandfather knew beforehand about emergency demands that would be made for the Korean War. No, it was more than that. He must have predicted those emergency demands from the very beginning, when he started investing his money. The history books make it sound like all of Japan made a large profit off the emergency, emergency demands during the Korean War, but that isn't actually true. Only a very limited number of the super rich played the money game and made an easy profit. Most of the citizens remained poor. In other words, Grandfather was a member of this extremely lucky group of winners. I'm pretty sure this all happened during the year Showa 25, 1950 or so. The Great Kanto Earthquake happened in Taisho 13, 1924, so... That means Grandfather was able to revive the near-dead Ushiromiya family in only about 20 years to a level even higher than it had ever been before. Sounds suspicious! With that, you'd think he'd revive the main family in Odawara. But for some reason, he went and did something as crazy as buying an entire small island in the Izu archipelago. Buying an entire island is not something that you can ordinarily do today. However, 
grandfather was clever. He contacted the GHQ and applied for the establishment of a marine resource base. He acquired this island as a business property, then tossed that project aside and claimed it as his own plot of land. After the war, there were prevention measures against food, so food shortages, and having the sponsorship of the GHQ meant that nobody could oppose him. From what I've heard, the Tokyo me metropolis of that day offered this land to him practically for free. Later, Tokyo made difficulties by telling Kinzo to return the land, but the pushy GHQ intervened. Anyway, it seems under-the-table bribes did their work well. In the end, the city gave up in frustration. Grandfather, with considerable skill and good luck, managed to weather the stormy seas of that period, obtaining, obtaining a vast fortune and his own island. The dream. Of course, it probably wasn't all luck. He was obsessed with all things Western, which helped him cultivate his English skills. He was able to use this to his advantage and sink his teeth into the GHQ. A mansion was built on the island soon after. This mansion, in fact. And thank you, I, I assumed that. Grandfather, with his love of the Western style, made this once uninhabited island a canvas upon which he could realize his dreams to his heart's content. Ina. He now had the western mansion of his dreams, overflowing with emotion and, ap and atmosphere, and a beautiful garden featuring all sorts of roses. Oh, look at that beach! And he had a private beach where nobody other than himself would ever be permitted to leave a footprint. Oh, that looks so nice. This would be a dream come true for any boy. And girl. After that, he made good use of his huge fortune becoming a large stockholder in the extremely stable iron and steel industry, and was able to live an easy and comfortable life just using the dividends. Well, he's just that incredible. This kind of person usually has the ability for, to foresee and predict the future, or at least that is how they're portrayed after the fact. But Grandfather denies all of that, repeatedly saying that he was simply blessed with extraordinary luck. Anyway. Even a lord like that can't help but grow increasingly eccentric when locked up alone on an island where all his dreams are made real. Everyone knows that he's had a western obsession from the start, but none of our parents really know when his bizarre black magic hobby began. Did his love of black magic begin way back when he became fascinated with everything western? Or did his miraculous stretch of good luck while reviving his family cause him to feel a mysterious power in himself? At some point, Grandfather began to make the research of black magic his life's work. He filled his study up with suspicious books, chemicals, and magical items as he became increasingly bizarre. That sounds awesome. From what I've heard, those around him warmly question mark, watched over him figuring that someone who had achieved success in life had a right to do as he pleased. But... There's no way that's true. They were probably just creeped out, thinking, that's disgusting, I don't want to get involved. Anyway, that agitated period was an age of big gambles, with both opportunities and risks. Let's say Grandfather was born in this time period. He would have had no opportunities and probably and would probably have advanced like a chess piece from mandatory education to college at a leisurely pace, never becoming more than an average salary man. If that happened, he'd probably have sat somewhere happily talking behind his boss's back. No, no, not in a fancy dining hall like this, more like at a table in some bar. Then again, I'll bet this family conference would be a whole lot more relaxing if that were the case. Okay, that's enough about the old geezer. That was a long history lesson. More importantly, let's talk about this incredible lunch. No, I don't care what you ate. I'm already convinced by that sashimi salad appetizer. Oh god, do we have to? Godasan's an excellent chef. I don't care about your food, I really don't. Plus, these fish were caught in the adjacent seas, weren't they? They're totally different from the sashimi you get at the supermarket. Hey, quit it, battler. Your upbringing will be exposed. Everyone let out a big laugh. Damn it, you say that even though you love you love those cheap pubs. Hey man, cheap pubs are cool. Ha 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 ha. 
I've eaten at many unusual places because of work, but this stands right up there with the best of them. I'd be willing to bet Godasan used to be pretty well known in those circles. Well, I don't know the details, but stuff got complicated at the long-standing hotel he used to work at, what with them of opening a new establishment with the same name and breaking into factions or whatever it was. In the middle of all that, he was apparently forced to retire. At that time, Mum just happened to be sending out job offers for a servant. As Goda removed the empty plates, he began to recount his own bumpy past without losing his smile. The world is a difficult place. However, thanks to the madam, I was given a chance to display my skills as a chef once again, this time for the Ushiromiya family. Although I enjoy experiencing the smiles of a larger number of people, I also find it quite entertaining to perform more delicate work that can please the limited number of those who have employed me. Holy crap, that was a long sentence. All this is thanks to the opportunity given to me by the madam. Godasan respectfully bowed his head toward aunt, towards Aunt Natsuhi. That's because you were the most talented of the applicants. The decision was purely objective, not based on personal feelings, so there is no need to thank me. Dang, why does Aunt Natsuhi always have to sound so indifferent? Probably the raging headaches. If only she spoke with a bit more kindness, she might leave a different impression. Hey, Kumasawa-san. Shannon-chan and Kumasawa-san entered from the hallway with a serving cart. Please excuse us. Now then, let us move on to today's dessert. Goda-san and the others laid the beautifully adorned dessert out in front of us all. I guess it's true when they say you have another stomach for dessert. It's true. I thought I'd already filled up on delicious food, but as soon as I laid eyes on that dessert, my stomach started yelling more. More, more, more. I don't know much about desserts, but this looked really good. A white pudding-like substance yeah, was garnished with two shades of red sauce. And elegant rose petals adorned the dish. Normally, during a high-class meal like this, you're supposed to wait for the chef to extol the virtues of this particular meal before eating. However, <laughs> Maria was completely indifferent to strict rules like that. So she got excited by this beautiful and delicious looking dessert, jumping into the fray as soon as it was placed before her. Aunt Rosa scolded her, calling it bad manners, <laughs> but George responded by saying, now, now, it's okay. Ooh, this part's sour. This part's sour. Batla, this one's no good. Ooh. Maria exclaimed as she sampled the two colored sauces. What, some are good and some bad? Okay, I'll give it a go. Mmm. Apparently one sauce was sweet and the other sour. Despite it being bad manners, I also stuck my little finger in and licked it. Whoa, one of the sauces was sour enough to make you pucker up. If it were yellow, I would have suspected lemon, but I couldn't guess what kind of sourness would be red. Grapefruit? I decided to ask Shannon, who was putting away the serving cart behind us. Shannon-chan, what kind of sauce is this sour stuff? Um, uh, uh... Shannon-chan hesitated. Maybe her job was just to set the table so she didn't really know. Still, even considering that, she seems pretty stressed. <laughs> Working there, wouldn't you be pretty stressed too? Maybe I shouldn't have asked. Or did they use some ingredient that we'd be better off not knowing about? <gasps> Has everybody been drugged? While Aunt Natsuhi made a gesture that seemed to indicate an oncoming headache, Kumasawa-san, who was sitting at the table at the opposite seat, began to chuckle. <laughs> what do you think we made it out of? Ho ho ho, it'll shock you. Huh? I don't have a clue. Wait a sec. Kumasawa-ba-san? That laugh's pretty creepy. So what is it? Don't tell anyone, okay? Listen very carefully. Kumasawa-san leaned across from the other side of the table. I leaned forward myself when she asked. Their interest caught Jessica, George Aniki, and of course Maria also put their ears closer. Ooh, what? What? Quickly, quickly. You see, the sour part is made from juice squeezed from a mackerel. Oh, what? Ho ho ho, what? Uh, I have a lot of questions. 
<laughs> what? Mackerel? That's crazy, we all thought, horrified. Had, uh, what? Wait, 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 wait. Only Maria accepted it, nodding sagely. Ooh? Mackerels are sour. Yeah, they are. This is what comes out when you squeeze them. <sighs> when Maria started clamoring that mackerel was sour, the adults were unable to contain their laughter. Only Aunt Rosa, her face red, whispered to Maria that mackerel is sour only once prepared as shime saba. Saba, I love saba. Ah, now I totally remember. Kumasawa-san was always like this, wasn't she? Like you couldn't tell from the other ten times she's pulled your leg? I think I remember her tricking me too in all sorts of ways when I was young. The most lethal has got to be that one. Those flimsy black things in Chinese dishes. What? They're kikurage mushrooms. Ah. She told me they were penguin meat, and I went all around school like a smartass telling everyone, didn't I? Kumasawa Bachan, you sure have it changed. You know Maria's gonna believe it now, right? Ho ho ho, it's just a joke. Now Goda-san's going to tell us what the sauce really is, won't he? Goda looked a little put off about his masterpiece being laughed at for such a bizarre reason. But after clearing his throat once, he introduced the dessert to us. Well then, allow me to introduce our dessert. After seeing how much you have all enjoyed the rose garden earlier today, I finished this panna cotta in a rose garden style. The rose petals scattered across were selected just now from that very rose garden. The sauce is a combination of two reds, strawberry and rose hips. Please enjoy this mixture of the strawberry sweetness and the rose hips sourness. Furthermore, the rose petals are merely decorative, so please avoid them while you eat. Uh, uh, yeah. With that said, please enjoy. Whoa, man, I almost want to applaud before eating. Just like with medicine, reading the detailed description first seems to make it work a whole lot better. As Godasan elaborated on the details of this dessert, it started to feel even more appetizing. Seriously, you should call it you should should you call him subtle or just talented. The dessert was probably planned from the beginning, but taking the hint when we all stopped in front of the rose garden earlier today, he displayed an incredible and timely awareness by just adding a few rose petals from that garden. Killed the flowers for nothing. This combination of sweet and sour was also exquisite. If it was just sweet, you'd just get used to it and bored halfway through. But if you reach the sour sauce at that point, you'd get a really vivid taste. And then, once you return to the sweet sauce, all of this sourness in your mouth would be replaced by an enjoyable sweetness. I'm sure everyone else felt the same way. Every time Godasan passed by one of our seats, someone praised the taste and his presentation. How is it, madam? Splendid, as always. It is worthy of entertaining our guests. I am most grateful for your words. Madam, did you know? I have heard that Rosehip has the ability to cure headaches. I thought that you in particular would appreciate it, so I had it specially prepared. Is that so? Thank you. See, didn't I tell you, Natsuhine-san? Rosehip is great for headaches. So it seems. I do hope it actually helps. Ha! Goda-san, I love ya. Hey, later on, why don't you tell me how they're treating you? Or if you can't, just let me know what sort of salary you'd like. <laughs> yeah, poach him. Having your talent confined to this small island is sacrilege to humanity's cooking culture. What do you think about working your craft for my company and delighting all our customers? Ha ha ha, Hideyoshi-san. Are you trying to steal away our Goda? Yes. Now that won't do at all. We'd better start treating Goda better, or he'll get snatched up. Giggle? Yes, you really should. If you don't, someone's gonna grab him and you'll be stuck with three meals of Kumasawa-san mackerel cooking a day, won't you? Hey man, there's nothing wrong with Saba. Ho ho ho, that's harsh. I'm standing right here. It seems someone's holding a grudge against me. Wah ha 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 ha. Everyone let out a huge laugh. According to Jessica, Kumasawa-san's mackerel jokes were a running gag that our parents had long since gotten used to. Kumasawa-san often claimed that mackerels had a precious nutritional value which could slow aging, 
make people smarter and more. Supposedly, while it couldn't stop the outward signs of outward signs of aging, it helped prevent it on the inside. Since she was still spirited enough to tell those kinds of jokes at her age, there must be something to that theory. Ho ho ho. In that case, if you'll excuse me, prepare yourself for tonight's dinner. Ha ha ha. I'll be cooking plenty of mackerel dishes for you all, so you'd better look forward to it. Hey man, I would love that. And I will prepare myself. Wa ha ha ha, we sure will. Now I'm hungry. Can't wait to get all puckered up from tonight's shimesaba. That sounds wonderful. I wonder if they'll be serving any good Japanese sake. Oh, we certainly will. Haven't you heard of Nokkenjima's famous mackerel shochu? Oh, delicious. <laughs> all right, and on the note of mackerel sake, we're going to end this episode here. I'll see you again in the next one. See ya.